We had talked, we had started to talk about this predation, and a lot of this is stuff you pretty much already know. We mentioned that population sizes change in response to predation patterns. So what happens when you have a lot of coyotes? What happens to the size of the rabbit population? It goes down. The next year when you have very few rabbits, what happens to the size of the coyote population? It goes down too. And boy, the next year is really nice for rabbits because you don't have so many darn coyotes trying to eat them. And so what happens to the size of the rabbit population? It goes up. And then you have lots of food for coyotes and what happens, you get the picture. It's this never-ending sort of merry-go-round of one population rises, the other one rises in response, then one shrinks. Um, predation really affects population sizes. And we had already seen that slide. I was just kind of reviewing briefly. Okay. We talked about how being an effective predator is something that's favored by natural selection. If you are a bad predator, you probably do not get enough calories. You probably don't survive. You probably don't. Thank you. Um, you probably don't live to pass on your genes. You probably don't bring home enough calories to keep your babies alive. Being a good predator means you have a better chance of passing on your genes. And if you're a prey species, and lots of, lots of species are prey species, um, if you're real easy to catch, you probably also don't get to pass on your genes. You probably don't survive long enough to pass on your genes. So natural selection favors or selects for good defense mechanisms. The way we very often phrase this idea is that a trait is selected for or a trait is selected against. So a trait that's selected for is something that's favored by natural selection, and that's kind of the direction that the species is going in. Um, predators get better every single generation. So why are there any prey species left at all? If the predators keep getting more effective, right, because the prey species keep getting wilier, faster, harder to see. So it's like this big arms race, and we'll talk about that idea of an arms race between predators and prey. Um, same thing applies to um, parasites and hosts, and so we'll talk about that next week. Okay, so traits can be selected for or uh, against. Okay, so how do those prey species keep up their end of the arms race? Well, you're walking down a sketchy street in a scary neighborhood, it's not a bad thing to look a little bit tougher than you actually are. And if you're a prey species, looking dangerous is a pretty good way to not get eaten. Mimicry is when a harmless species resembles a poisonous or distasteful species. And you actually drew a picture of these snakes in your illustrations. This is why coloring them is so important. Um, what you have there is one deadly poisonous snake and two that are totally harmless. But they're pretty hard to tell apart. And the other option, it might not be that you look like a dangerous species like these, but this, these two butterflies, look a lot alike. You might mistake one for the other. Well, the monarch is really, really bitter. It feeds on milkweed, which is a plant that grows wild around here. And milkweed is very bitter. It's got this bitter latex sap. So, though I don't eat butterflies usually, I have heard that the monarch is really awful. It's bitter and nasty tasting. The viceroy is not. The viceroy doesn't eat this bitter sap. 
but it looks like a monarch. So it's mimicking a species that doesn't taste good to birds. Birds like to eat butterflies, eat their fat, juicy little bodies, and leave their wings behind. If you find little butterfly wings not attached to a butterfly, you can bet that a bird had a lunch right there. The other option, so this, this is where you're looking like a distasteful species. The other option, one of the other options for prey species is to camouflage themselves. So if you blend in, you're not as likely to be found and eaten. And you guys all know what camouflage is. Many of you probably own one or more items of camo clothing. Um, so do I. But this... Can you see the insect in this picture? It's yeah, this is this is the insect right here. And it's called a stick insect. Um, it looks if it's holding still, it looks almost exactly like a branch. Makes it harder to see. Makes it harder to catch and eat. And the smarter and the better predators get, the sneakier prey gets. It is a continual arms race. Every generation, everybody ups the ante. Animals that eat plants are predators too. We consider herbivores to be predators on plants. Now here's the question. So we mentioned two basic defense mechanisms for prey species, mimicry, camouflage. We didn't even talk about being really fast. That's effective. Flying really high. <laughs> Do plants have defense mechanisms like that? What can a plant do if a predator wants to come after it? Sit there and scream silently while it gets torn leaf from leaf? Huh? That eats insects. So you're saying they can fight back. But clover can't fight back. Baby maple trees can't fight back. Can plants have defense mechanisms? Tough leaves are defense mechanisms. So plants have defense mechanisms. Has anybody ever picked black raspberries? Oh, they're wonderful and your arms are completely torn to shreds by the time you're done. You might have rips in your clothing. Yeah. Now, you know, if you're a deer, are you liable to wade right into the middle of the black raspberry patch? No. It hurts. You know. So thorns are a defense mechanism. Okay, so all of these things make it tougher to eat a plant. And these are considered... Physical barriers, that's a B. So these are physical barriers. I had to dot the I in a different color. They're physical barriers to getting eaten. You don't want to get a mouthful of thorns. Um, you don't want to get a mouthful of spines. In the desert, cactus are actually a great storage spot for water. You've probably heard this on like Survivor Man or something. And there are a lot of desert animals that if it weren't for the spines would probably just take chunks out of cactus flesh on a regular basis. But they don't because those spines protect them. Um, these are some really nice spines on a hawthorn. I don't know if you can see that. Thistles. Gosh, yeah. Thistles. My daughter just got nailed by a thistle last night. We were out in the garden when I got home from school, and she knelt down on a big thistle and went, Wah! Plant. You can have a physical barrier to get it eaten, a physical defense mechanism. Now, the other kind of defense mechanism you could have would be what? You can't run away. Ooh, poisons! Could a plant be poison? Of course it could. Lots of them! So, whoops, that's the wrong one. We have chemicals. 
So this is another way plants defend themselves. Another common way for plants to defend themselves is to make chemicals that are harmful to herbivores. And we call these things secondary compounds. So the first one we can discuss is tobacco. Now humans use tobacco. It's intoxicating to humans. Some of you may have used tobacco in dip or cigarettes or I don't know what. Um, there's a chemical in it called nicotine. And the first time you ever use tobacco, you're probably going to get lightheaded. It's a stimulant. It's a drug. Um, it's a mild poison. <laughs> it has this interesting effect on the human nervous system. Now, humans, of course, you know, seem to seek out a lot of these sor sorts of sensations. If a wild animal bites a tobacco leaf, their mouth's going to tingle and burn, and they might get lightheaded that's not something they're going to want to make a part of their diet. Because no wild animal wants to be all disoriented and dizzy because something is about to chase them and kill them. You know, rabbits don't want to be intoxicated. It's dangerous enough already, thank you very much. Would an animal get addicted to keep eating? I suppose, but I also imagine that the threshold... Well, it's a reasonable question. I would imagine that the threshold um, for toxicity is probably, I mean, if you're talking about a rabbit, you know, like a four pound rabbit, probably wouldn't take a whole lot of tobacco to kill it. Do you know potatoes are poisonous? Yeah, yep, the plants. Well, if they're green, the greening on the skins. Okay. Not, not greened are fine. Um, and, the, and the tops of tomatoes are poisonous also. Okay, so tobacco makes nicotine. You're probably familiar with this beauty. Poison ivy. Who's gotten poison ivy here? Right now? No, who has ever gotten it in their life? Oh, I'm so glad you said that. Somebody says that in every class. I don't get poison ivy. I say that, sure. Okay. Well, let me, let me tell you something. Okay. Um, the, best, the best hypothesis that I've heard, because I did not get poison ivy until I was 26 years old. And then I started getting it. The best hypothesis is the exposure threshold. So for some people, maybe you have 10 exposures and now you're sensitized, you're going to react. Maybe you have 100 exposures and now you're sensitized, now you're going to react. Maybe you have 1,000 exposures and then you're sensitized, then you're going to react. Somebody might have 5,000. I'm around it all the time. Well, you may have a real high exposure threshold. You may be very lucky. I was around it all the time, too. I grew up walking through poison ivy, you know, in and out of old barns and fields and fence rows, you know, in poison ivy, up to my knees. So, these are all secondary compounds. Wild cherries make a nice little secondary compound, too. Have you ever heard of cyanide? What's cyanide? It's a deadly poison. It'll kill you. It'll kill bed bugs, it'll kill fleas, it'll kill rabbits, it'll kill dogs, it'll kill cows, it'll kill anything. Deadly poison. Wild cherries, these are not the cherries you buy in the store. These have these beautiful little sprays of white flowers, you can see there. They grow all over the place. Um, they're like little black, little tiny black cherries. They have a, a bark with little small dark squares, sort of um, blackish bark. Um, beautiful firewood, high BTU content. Well, their bark, their leaves, and the pits of the fruit all contain cyanide. You, don't, you can eat the fruit from around the pit. You do not want to eat the pits. You don't want to eat the leaves. You also don't want it in pastures with animals because cattle can eat those leaves, and if they eat enough of them, they'll get sick and they'll die. Now, here's a question. What does secondary mean? What does secondary mean? Is that a definition right now? Yeah. Well, not secondary compounds, just the word secondary. Second, like less than primary. Second, yeah. So if your primary purpose in getting up this morning was that you smelled coffee, that's reasonable. 
And your secondary purpose was that you knew you legally have to come to school or they'll come get you. Okay. Why are these called secondary compounds and not primary compounds? Okay, what would be more important for a plant? So what would be the primary job of a plant? What did, what did Hank Green say biology was all about? Sex. Sex and not dying. Guess what's most important for plants? Just the second part of that sentence for now. Not dying. Not dying. How do plants make a living? They take sunlight and they do this magical, it's not magical at all. They do photosynthesis. What do they need to perform photosynthesis? Chlorophyll. Chemical called chlorophyll. And what do they make as a product of photosynthesis? Sugar. Sugar. Those are their primary compounds. Those are the things that keep them alive to begin with. If they, if they can't feed their cells, then it doesn't matter if they have nicotine or urushol or cyanic acid because they starve to death. So the primary chemicals are the ones that they're using to feed themselves. But the secondary compounds are these ones that are defense, essentially defensive compounds. And humans actually use a lot of secondary compounds in plants. Like I said, nicotine we use. Um, I don't know if we first synthesized cyanic acid, cyanide from cherries or not. Um, aspirin, who here has ever taken an aspirin? Okay, aspirin was first synthesized, it's, it's an extract of willow bark. Salicylic acid is the active ingredient in aspirin. That is, a, that is a chemical that exists in willow bark. It makes the bark bitter. It makes it not taste good to animals who want to eat it. It's a secondary compound. It happens to have pain relieving effects in humans, probably in other mammals too. Um, but those are all secondary compounds. Okay, so tomorrow, reminder, you need to have um, not your best sparkliest brand new white sneakers on. Um, something, I, I will keep you out of knee deep mud. We're not like going wading in the pond or anything, but I cannot promise a mud free world. And I don't even think you'll need jackets because it's supposed to be in the mid-70s tomorrow afternoon. <laughs> um, but if you feel like you need a jacket, then you should bring a jacket. So I don't think you'll need one. So that's it.